Ronnie, Ronnie got me out there. You know, he 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 had offered me the gig back in 1990, and I had turned it down um, because I wanted my I wanted my band, which is called was called Lion at the time. It was called Lion. Um, we had, we had a record that was coming out, and I just didn't. I wasn't ready to to cut out, you know. I didn't want to. Yeah. I wanted my band to make it, and we had made a really good record, which was very kind of White Snake inspired because our singer was from Britain, and um, so we were not the average LA kind of you know strip band. We were like this European style band because we were influenced by White Snake and Deep Purple and uh, Thin Lizzy and stuff like that. Um, so we got a deal on a on a smallish records company and our record just they never promoted it but it was a good record so ronnie asked me to join and i was just wanting to try and regroup that band and get it back out there in the end it didn't work out but but 10 years later or 11 years later um i did a session a session with jimmy bain and um he said ronnie's looking for a new guitar player what do you think and i was like let's go so it took a little while for us to get together and it was like it was the day after christmas and um ronnie called and said okay let's let's go meet up at the pub and we went to this place robin hood pub in the valley here and he goes so doug um how have you been i'm like good ronnie and he goes well um you know i'm working on this record right now with guys and maybe you know maybe maybe you want to play a couple solos on it i was like no i don't want to play a couple i'm going to do the whole thing, all of it, and join the band. He goes, okay, great, start tomorrow. And so that was it. And Ronnie, he was so amazing. You know, he was like, he would basically, he'd be sitting in the studio the entire time, no matter what anybody was doing, but he was doing crossword puzzles, like all the, during the whole session, unless he was singing. So I'd, I'd say, hey, Ronnie, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? He, he would he'd look up from his crossword puzzle, like, what? He'd be like, listen, he goes, oh, that's great, mate. Keep going, you know. And and then he get back to his. He was like into his puzzles. That's my biggest memory of being in the studio with Ronnie. And then touring, I really learned a lot by watching him. How he he was just fearless on stage. You know, there's he he owned the stage so so much. It was incredible, you know, to watch him. And and he brought the best of that out of everybody that he worked with. And um, so during that. We toured for about a year off that record. It was called uh, Killing the Dragon in 2002. <laughs> and during that time, David Coverdale apparently um, was putting White Snake back together and just out of the blue called me and said, you know, I'd like you to, to join. And, and uh, it's just a two month tour I'm going to do with the Scorpions co-headline. And, and um, I said, well, I mean, talk to Ronnie and I'll, I'll, you know, I got to think about it. And he goes, well, all right, when you get rid of the word think, call me back. And he, i never forget he said that. So I talked to Ronnie, and Ronnie goes, yeah, two months, whatever. Well, two months turned into 11 years that I was with David. And I did go back with, with Ronnie a few times for um, some live touring. And we had done a DVD at the end of 2002, and then I slipped in on a tour with him in 2005, and all of a sudden we're in London, and there's – they're filming and i'm like what's this and wendy says we're doing a dvd you know and i'm like oh okay so i had to you know really brush up really quick and get prepared for that but um working with ronnie he was very dedicated to a certain sound that he wanted in his head and david was and that was brilliant and david was in opposite in that sense that he basically would look for any inspiration out of anything i mean it could, could play somebody could play a banjo part or something he'd be like that's a great riff you know and and it really opened up my mind to um to how to compose and work on things and really it was really great that's when i really first started get, writing on acoustic was with david we would we'd sit in my backyard and just toss ideas back and forth on the guitar and then little by little we'd move into the studio and it would get to, you know, we'd do some electric yeah. demos and stuff, but both guys super amazing. Both guys, the best at their at their gig. You know, for me, Ronnie was the greatest heavy metal singer ever. 
and David's for me the, the the greatest heavy blues rock singer. I mean, there's but that tone, the tone that both of those guys get is un unbelievable. And I can't, I have to actually look back and pinch myself that I worked with them. And now working with Glenn and guys like John Karabi and, you know, I've just been super blessed, you know? Yeah, I mean, you've worked with some brilliant vocalists. I mean, do, when you um, are creating a, like a sound on your guitar, do you, do you think of a tone that's going to complement their tone? Or is that something that you think well, about? Doing. I, I definitely had a with, with with Dio I only wrote three songs with him total over the whole time I wrote a couple songs for um, Killing the Dragon and that was basically we were I was just trying to fill out the album with song types that we didn't have so that it would yeah. have, a, have a, 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 a good even flow to it so it wasn't any, wasn't any point in writing something that, that he already had in the same tempo or whatever so I was looking for riffs that he would like that were in a different groove or a different mood, something like that. W with David, I had a real background of early White Snake that I really loved, and I, to be honest, I, you know, I, as much as I loved '87 and the later years of White Snake, I kind of wanted to get um, a little more of that bluesy influence back. So I started, you know, coming up with riffs and things that were that were more bluesy so um and david he liked that so we kind of tried to meld the two together and make a hybrid of white snake um so yeah i would definitely come up with bluesier stuff for david yeah did um did Dio ever talk about richie richie blackmore yeah. yes he told did me it? yeah he told i mean there was always there was amazing stories but there was one story that was super spooky that they were doing, um, I, I asked him, I was like, so what was it like? You know, I go, one of my favorite albums that you did with Ricky was, um, was um, one of the favorite songs was Gates of Babylon. Yeah. And, and um, God, I can't even believe it. What's, I spaced on the title of that album. But anyway, um, he goes, during that session, we were, I was long live rock and roll, sorry. Um, during that session, he goes, we were trying to record Gates of Babylon and it just wasn't, it just wouldn't happen. It just, we couldn't get it together. The, the tape would break or the power would go out or we'd be in the middle of that song and, and you know, Richie's guitar string would break or it just we couldn't get it done. And above the studio was this little room that used to hang out in and there, up there, there was a Ouija board. And a Ouija board for those people, most people know what it is, but it's one of those things like you do a seance and you, talk to the spirits and it, it yeah. out. and i've never i've never had one or touched one i've never even seen one being used but i've heard about it i would never dare do one of those we always talked about it when we were at school and it's like oh never <laughs> that's what ronnie said he goes we went up there and there was a ouija board and we said you know let's get let's get to the uh, they had a shot glass instead of the instead of the whatever the, the magnet yeah. piece of and they were asking, so, you know, are we going to be able to finish this album in time? And is it, you know, and all of a sudden it moved and it said, no. And it said, you know, are we going to be able to finish Gates of Babylon? No. Well, why won't, you know, who is this? And he spelled out B-A-A-L, Bal, or Ball. Bal, I guess it is. And um, so they're freaked out at this point. They're things, they're moving. And all of a sudden he said, um, why can't we finish this album? And it, then all of a sudden, this is what Ryan told me. The glass flipped up and started jumping around like this and went underneath the table and came back up on top of the thing and it spelled out B-L-A-C-K-M-O-R-E, Blackmore. And he, oh, and he no. goes, yeah, so he goes, so they said, it's because of Richie that we're not going to be able to finish this album? And he said, yes. Somehow they broke through and they, they were able to finish Gates of Babylon, which is one of the greatest guitar solos that Richie, for me, that, mm -hmm. that he ever did. And um, so in the credits on the album, you'll see it. It's, it says thanks to, you know, Polygram or whatever records. Thanks to the road crew. Thanks to the studio. Thanks to the catering. And then at the very bottom, no thanks to Ball. <laughs> so that was the story. But... And then, and then he said that Richie used to love 
to start fires. Like he. Oh, he's he, a pyromaniac. Well, that's what I know. I'm not saying that. I I love Richie and I respect him. And but when you when you're Richie Blackmore, you can pretty much get away with anything. And apparently he sometimes would, for fun would set Jimmy Bain's bed on fire just to see what would happen and how fast he could get out of it. That he put it out. Something. David had some Richie stories as well, but um, I think by that time, um, you know, Richie was starting to, you know, kind of, he just wanted a break maybe or whatever at that time. After Deep Purple um, 3 or 4, whatever it was. Yeah, I think he was a bit of a prankster, wasn't he, um, Richie Blackmore? Yeah, that's good. That's, I mean, and that's good fun on the road. People who hmm. do stuff, you know, it's, you don't want to, of course, set a fire to somebody's bed, but, but you know, there's lots of little pranks that, that happen on the road and it's super funny.